Good afternoon. My name is Raman Muthasamy, and I will be speaking to you today on transoral incisionless fundoplication, or TIF. Do we finally have an effective endoscopic anti reflux procedure? These are my disclosures. Today's talk will have uh, four main sections. One, uh, first, we'll talk about why have prior endoscopic anti reflux devices failed. Then, we'll cover the TIF procedure as well as indications, patient workup, and post-TIF care. And finally, we'll review the evidence behind TIF before concluding. So in order to understand why prior endoscopic options have failed, it's important to understand the anatomy of the gastroesophageal junction. Uh, and this is really comprised of sort of the angle of hiss here, which you can see uh, is in the region of the lower esophageal sphincter and where it meets uh, with the fundus of the stomach in the region of the cardia. And then there's also an area called the gastroesophageal flap valve, which is here in orange, which is 180 degrees and maintains closure against the lesser curve of the stomach. And this is helped close by pressure from the stomach to prevent reflux. And these uh, anatomical constructs are key into helping avoiding reflux. Now the anti-reflux barrier is compromised in patients with GERD for a variety of reasons. First, the phrenoesophageal membrane results in a loss of elasticity of the esophagus and the GE junction does not return to its appropriate intra-abdominal position. Of course, a hiatal hernia occurs when the LES and the diaphragm are no longer in line with each other. The angle of hiss tends to be uh, not as sharp or you have increased relaxations of the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. And all of these contribute to reflux. And so here we see what normal anatomy looks like and compare that to the loss of the angle uh, and the length of the valve in the intra-abdominal portion. And uh, really on endoscopic findings, uh, you'll see a nice tight uh, valve hugging the scope here, whereas here in a patient with reflux and a dysfunctional valve, it's loose, leading to reflux. So endoscopically, uh, we've tried a variety of things. First, we tried a thermal technique to induce collagen deposition around the cardia to tighten it. Uh, there have been suturing and stapling methods to help alter and resharpen that angle of hiss or to elongate or augment the LES pressure, which tends to be the most anatomically appropriate way to do this. Um, or even trying to inject uh, bulking or agents into the LES to increase the mass effect. And uh, again, a variety of endoscopic techniques have been developed. You can see uh, there are uh, six here on this list, uh, but none of these really currently have significant uh, adoption. Uh, and even though FDA approval occurred for many of these around the turn of the century, uh, the graveyard for endoscopic technologies is long and, and my uh, sort of anti-reflux uh, a perspective for endoscopic options uh, was sort of like this guy in the top right. Uh, seeing the prior failures, I was somewhat skeptical to jump. So uh, I'm now going to transition to talking about the TIF procedure. Um, and again, uh, the, the main difference I think is, is here that we more approximate the surgical anatomic uh, corrections that are made. Uh, and I think the durability of this device uh, is, is, is superior as you'll see. So uh, the terminology, again, TRIF stands for transoral incisionless fundoplication. It's the name of the procedure. Uh, and esophix is the name of the device used to perform the procedure. And that's the device here on the right and the procedure and what it looks like is on the left. So on the device, it really does four things. It helps sort of uh, reduce um, small hernias, suctioning the esophagus, make it intra-abdominal. Um, it grabs tissue from the cardia and sort of pulls it in from the stomach to allow for this wrap. And then it secures it with these fasteners, uh, so-called serosa fasteners, uh, those little blue devices. And you'll see a video in a moment. Now, this procedure has undergone evolution. So it first was called endoluminal uh, fundoplication, and it was, that was in 2005. The fasteners were actually placed across the stomach and not across the GE junction, um, and it was only 10 fasteners. Then it sort of became TIF 1.0 in 2007, 
Um, and then this became, um, it went up higher into the esophagus and created an esophagogastric uh, plication, but it was only about a centimeter above the Z-line with 12 plications. And then the 2.0 procedure, which has really been the standard for the last decade in which the majority of commercial cases, you can see over 20,000 now, um, really creates an esophagogastric plication that's up to three centimeters above the Z-line, uh, increasing that length of the high pressure zone and has 12 to 23 fasteners. And as you can see on the bottom here, the wraps have gotten really more um, you know, circumferential. This is a 270 degree wrap now, and a hiatal a hernia, I mean, a, a Nissen fundamental plication is a 360, but you can see that the, this is more closely approximating a surgical fundamental plication. As you can see here uh, in this nice graph, uh, red being higher pressure, you can see that with each iteration, the pressure with the uh, these uh, techniques have increased, and it's now approaching uh, what you would get with a Nissen, which is on the far right here. So comparing TIF to surgical uh, laparoscopic fundoplication, again, the TIF is really for um, hernias that are two centimeters or less. If it's more than two centimeters, uh, you really would benefit from having um, a hernia reduction and closing the crura prior to doing this. Uh, they both procedures elongate the intradominal um, esophagus and they also serve to fix that anatomy, reducing the dynamics and the angle of hiss and restoring the distal high pressure zone uh, at the GEJ. So here's an example of endoscopic imaging before and after TIF. So here's, a, you can see a, a loose valve here. Uh, you can now see the device here, the esophix device sort of doing the TIF procedure and sort of creating the wrap. And here's the post wrap uh, and CT imaging showing the post wrap. Uh, so here's a video here that sort of shows uh, the uh, TIF procedure. And, uh, and you can see uh, in this schematic here, uh, here's the esophix device. And uh, so you can see in this device here, uh, it initially goes down, it's almost uh, 20 millimeters. So you do have to avoid any uh, esophageal strictures. Uh, and uh, you can see it creates an omega 270 degree wrap that's three centimeters long. The scope initially goes through the device and then is advanced into the stomach uh, and then uh, you can see through the patient here so you do have to uh, make sure that uh, you know the the upper esophagus and, and can accommodate this uh, and then once the scope is in the st uh, stomach then you pull it back uh, flex the device and then push the scope out to provide visualization so at this point uh, you'll see the grasper grasp the tissue it pulls down into uh, the tissue into this uh, sort of uh, the bending arm here and you can create the uh, plication and the idea is to make this distance about three centimeters and so you sort of uh, when you're doing this uh, you can pull down on the esophagus to kind of again further reduce small hernias uh, and then also reduces the chance of uh, putting the fasteners across the diaphragm and then here you create an esophagogastric plication you can see you put two fasteners on at a time here. So then you sort of loosen this and you kind of turn this around and you sort of uh, march your way around the 270 uh, to create uh, sort of this omega valve here. So here you can see sort of, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 of these uh, having been placed. And then once you've put this in place, they're called serosa fuse because the idea is you have the serosa of the stomach and esophagus here, uh, you know, sort of fusing together. Uh, and, uh, and then that's going to be what creates the long-term durability of this. And so here, this is the mechanism for the creation of this valve. So I'm going to move forward uh, to talking about indications uh, and uh, for patient uh, workup uh, before the procedure and post-TIF care. So again, the indications are for adults uh, who have had a partial to incomplete response uh, to da of daily reflux symptoms to anti-secretory medications, namely proton pump inhibitors, usually for six months or more. Again, you have to have a small uh, hill valve and, and hernia. I'll come back to that in a minute, um, a hill grade valve. And uh, um, again, you do have to have proven GERD by endoscopy, a pH study or barium imaging. Uh, and again, abnormal pH studies um, uh, on PPI would be another indication uh, as well, uh, you know, showing refractory GERD. So when would you not do this? People who are, um, have a BMI above 35, large hernias uh, would require a hernia fixation first. Sometimes we do combination procedures where the hernia is fixed intraoperatively and then at the same time we do the TIF. The advantage of that is you get the benefit of the 270 wrap, which uh, leads to less side effects such as gas bloat and dysphagia. Uh, 
again, there's a variety of other contraindications, primarily issues with uh, esophageal anatomic abnormalities, strictures, obstruction, neck mobility, and so forth. So again, here's the hill valve issue, which is when you go into the stomach and sort of retroflex on endoscopy, if it's nice and tight, it's a one. If it's a little loose, it's a two. If it's more than uh, a scope or two uh, width here, this is a three. And again, this is a very large uh, hiatus here. Um, and threes and four hill valves really need a, a surgical correction of the hernia prior to doing a TIF procedure. Ones and twos uh, can be done without any surgical correction. So it's important when you're doing the endoscopies, traditionally we think of the axial length. Uh, so in forward view, we see where the pinch of the diaphragm is and where the LES is. But it's important to also look in retroflex to assess the hill valve and see how many scope diameters um, the sort of transverse hernia is, the gap in the crura, because that is also essential in determining TIF candidacy. So most patients, uh, you know, with reflux will typically be able to be managed successfully with lifestyle or acid suppression therapy and follow up. But some patients, probably 30% or more, uh, may have suboptimal response or intolerance to the medications, uh, more often uh, suboptimal response. And the workup, again, typically involves a motility testing with manometry, pH evaluation, um, possibly anatomic imaging with a esophagram. Uh, and finally, um, you know, there are, um, you know, special situations you have to assess for on the endoscopy to determine if a, a surgical correction may be needed as well. Um, for those with very advanced hernias, and Nissen is probably the appropriate option, but for the remainder of the people who are Hill sort of one, two, and some threes, um, you know, an endoscopic technique uh, would be appropriate. So the procedure is done under general anesthesia. It takes about three quarters of an hour. It requires two operators, one for the scope and one for the esophics device. Um, typically there's intraoperative uh, paralysis to avoid, um, uh, avoid hitting the diaphragm during the placations. We do give them uh, prophylactic antibiotics as well as IV fluids and nausea medicines interprocedurally, and they're usually observed overnight in the hospital. Um, on discharge, uh, patients get some medicines for, for pain, anti-nausea and gas medicines, uh, a laxative, and of course we'll continue their PPI in the short term. Um, I've typically, my experience has been I really don't hear at all from these patients uh, until their two week follow up visit. So in terms of diet, we're trying to get the serosa to sort of fuse here. So we don't want to stretch that area too much. So the first three days are a clear liquid diet. Then we move to a blenderized full diet uh, up until the end of the second week. We then advance to pureed foods and then finally move to medium soft foods in weeks five and six. After six weeks, uh, one can resume a regular diet and and uh, we actually have a 15 page handout at ucla that details uh how to progress with the diet in terms of activity uh the main things really you can resume full activity after six weeks as well uh, main thing is you don't want to do uh, a heavy lifting of objects and so initially you sort of uh, walk up you know you can certainly do minimal physical activity for the first week slowly increase your activity and then uh, really just you can do everything except intense exercise or lifting objects more than 25 pounds uh, at the end and we typically see patients back uh, at one to two weeks uh, at three months and then as needed after that insurance coverage there is uh, insurance coverage for both the procedure and uh, for the combined hernia repair and tiff which is really covered by all parties uh, the straight procedure without the hernia repair is covered by medicare but typically requires authorization uh, for that procedure from, pi from pri uh, private payers. So I'll close by talking a little bit about the evidence summary behind this. Does this work and how much data is there? It's primarily from two review articles reviewing the data, including one uh, that I did with some colleagues that was published a few months ago. Um, the evidence base for TIF uh, really arises from five separate systematic reviews, five randomized controlled trials, multiple cohort studies, and in total, there's over 140 publications with 1,600 unique patients and some follow-up data of up to eight to 10 years. So the evidence uh, is certainly uh, plentiful. Um, in terms of the summary, uh, it really does improve heartburn, regurgitation, which is the feeling of liquid coming into the chest, and GERD-related quality of life scores compared to sham. 
The acid reflux is reduced or even normalized in between 40 and 80 percent of patients, and the impact on LES pressures, how much it tightens that, is um, not well studied uh, as well as the others. Um, it does reduce the need for medication therapy up to five years, and between 40 and 90 percent are able to stop the medications at various stages of follow-up. And it does appear to be superior to medications in eliminating or reducing those regurgitation or extraesophageal symptoms such as a hoarseness uh, and certain lung conditions. So again, a summary of the systematic review shows a procedural success rate of 99%, low rates of adverse events of 2%, hernia reduction in 91%, and elimination of meds in 88%. Uh, another study of only randomized controlled trials of lapnison uh, or TIF with sham or PPI showed that, uh, that the TIF was actually the best in quality of life because you had fewer problems with side effects such as dysphagia, trouble swallowing, or gas bloat. But the Nissen had uh, better objective parameters in terms of pressure and acid exposure. So as you expect, the tighter you get, the more side effects. Um, so you have fewer side effects with a slightly looser wrap which is what a TIF is. So again, here you see that most patients are able to come off of medications, and on the right, the healing of esophagitis is uh, around 80% or higher. And then for pH reductions, look at the two red boxes. You can see here that um, there's statistically significant reductions in pH scores, uh, 7.8 to 3.6 in this study. And if you take a look at how often can you normalize the pH, uh, it's between anywhere around half to two thirds of the time that that can occur after this technique. Serious adverse events are very rare, between two to 2.4%. And most of those occurred in the earlier procedures, not in uh, the later procedures. And this appears to be decreasing with time, likely due to operator experience and advances in the device. Um, the, pop, the perforation rate is extremely low, less than 1%, mostly in from earlier studies. Uh, and again, there are rare rates of bleeding and pneumothorax. My experience has been uh, this is a very safe procedure with very few calls or even side effects um, in my experience to date. Two studies on durability, one at 10 years showed that 92% had stopped or have their anti-secretory medication use. The other one uh, of 57 patients, of which 23 had long-term follow-up, showed that um, several, three quarters had resumed some anti-secretory use, but overall 80% were still satisfied with their reflux management. And so uh, of the many uncontrolled of uh, GERD sufferers, probably 6.7 million, um, only a small percentage elect surgery. Uh, most patients with reflux are managed well with medicines, but perhaps the TIF may be a procedure, may be something to consider as an endoscopic option in 30 to 35% who either want to avoid a surgical fund application and in many cases may be able to avoid surgery altogether if they have a small hernia. So in summary, TIF is a, appears to be a safe, effective, and relatively durable technique uh, if for endoscopic anti-reflux option that improves symptoms and reduces medication use, and it can improve and sometimes normalize objective parameters of reflux through pH studies. Obviously, like any test uh, and any uh, procedure, it needs to be uh, careful patient selection and an appropriate pre-procedure workup, particularly hernia assessment, to assess uh, to achieve clinical success. And the technique does not preclude subsequent fundoplication and may even be used after a prior fundoplication. So again, I thank you for your attention. These are some of my colleagues at the Kardashian Center for Esophageal Health. And I have two partners, Dr. Sederat and Thacker, and our contact information as we all perform this procedure. Thank you so much for your time and attention today.